In this module, you're going to learn about how to send EDI messages from BizTalk Server. In the first lesson, we'll provide an introduction to sending EDI messages, how the send ports work and use the party information, and how we set up you know, sending out and processing of EDI messages. And in the second lesson, we'll focus on batching messages, where we'll have multiple messages that we want to group together into a batch and send out as one single EDI document. As we look in the first lesson at the EDI sending capabilities, we'll understand how we send out those messages and the architecture that's involved in sending out those EDI messages. We'll talk about the EDI assembler and its role in using schemas and parsing those and serializing that information out how the party is determined to figure out what transport settings, what particular protocol settings need to be used, and also the various interchange properties and extended validation that we can apply. Finally, we'll show a demonstration showing how to create and send an EDI message. When you're sending EDI messages, the party information is very important to understand how to take an XML document and turn it into the appropriate EDI document with all the information required for transaction sets and interchange numbers and those sorts of things. But there's also pieces that are specific to BizTalk and really don't tie into EDI. For example, how a message arrives at a send port uses the standard BizTalk message routing and the subscription model. But once that message does arrive at that send port, and it gets into the processing pipeline, the EDI components will kick in and they'll use that party information to process the message. You can see here in the diagram that on the this particular case, the receiving side, we could be receiving any kind of messages here. They may or may not be EDI messages. They may just be XML documents or flat files that we receive and they get published into the message box. At that point, they may simply be routed to a send port where we'll have a send pipeline that does the EDI processing, takes that XML document and serializes it out as an EDI document with all the appropriate values and the protocol settings. And then we send it out through any particular adapter. Another option that we'll talk about in lesson two is that as messages are received, they can be subscribed to by the batching orchestration and they may go into there in, in a kind of holding pattern where they'll wait as references to that batching orchestration until we're ready for them to all be released as a single EDI message. But as I said, you can see that the routing all is typical BizTalk routing. Messages are going to get to a send port and we apply maps and it's once we get into the pipeline model that we'll see the EDI components kick in and start processing that message. The EDI assembler is the key component in those pipelines that's going to process the messages. It's going to take the XML and generate that EDI document, be responsible for any envelope creation that needs to happen. Now that EDI assembler component is included in the AS2 EDI send pipeline and the EDI send pipelines that are included with BizTalk server. But you can also put it into your own custom pipelines as well. When a message arrives at that assembler, it's going to be an XML message and that assembler is going to look at the message and try and figure out what the schema is. It'll do that by looking at the namespace within the XML document and doing typical BizTalk resolution. And it's going to go and find that particular schema then and be able to do validation and also have all the metadata it needs to know how to serialize out the EDI message. In order to get all of the values and all the configuration that the component needs, that that EDI assembler needs, it'll need to go and look up the party and find the appropriate configuration. Now the first place it's going to look is in the message context properties for the EDI destination party name. If it doesn't find a party there, it will then go and look at the four properties for the destination party receiver identifier and qualifier and the sender identifier and qualifier. So if it can find those 
pairs of information to identify the sender and receiver, it can use that to go find the appropriate agreement in the configuration. Now, if none of those properties are found, it'll fall back to the global settings that are available and try and use those. And then it will figure out based on, uh, regardless of which of those three ways it finds the settings, it'll then use that information to generate the EDI envelope, including the, the header and group information. So the job of the assembler is to use one of these different mechanisms to find the configuration that along with the schema will tell it how to create the appropriate EDI message to be sent down to the adapter. Now when we configure the parties and the agreements and all those profiles, we can also set up some interchange properties. So we can set properties around the ISA or the, the UNA, UNB segments. We can set properties around how to handle headers, so the, the GS or the ST, or the UNG or UNH, depending on whether we're using X12 or the Edifact. Now what the EDI assembler is going to do is use that configuration, that information, to set up the transaction sets into those outbound documents. When you're setting those, as we'll see in the user interface, you're able to go in and for specific document types, you can have different settings around how to handle those interchanges. So you may want to have different uh, X12 document specifications and for each one you want to have some different settings around how to handle those things or different values. You can do that within the tool. You can also see here that when we set up the the configuration of those protocols and things we also have the ability to set up the validation and we can do the EDI type validation which will give us as you see the field length and required fields and repeat count kind of the core things but you can also enable through a checkbox the extended validation so that we'll use the schema and all of the metadata that it provides to validate the information we can validate things such as leading or trailing zeros or spaces and, and trailing separators those sorts of things so you can see in the dialog to the right, down near the bottom, that we're specifying the settings here. And in this case, the item that's selected up above is checked as the default. And so these settings would apply to any kind of transaction set. But you'll notice the second column is the transaction type, which means that we can add rows here with different transaction types. And then as we go through, each of those transaction types can have different settings around the validation, around the leading and trailing zeros and spaces and the trailing separator policy. And we can edit that information for each of those different transaction types. And that information is going to get stored with the party so that as we send and we figure out the party and the document specification, then we use this configuration or rather the send component is the assembler is going to use that information to process the message and get it just right based on our configuration. In this demonstration, we're going to see how to map a message to the right schema. We're going to configure a send port for EDI, and then we'll test that with the fallback settings and also create an agreement to see what happens when we have specific settings around that. So we'll go from a BizTalk message that may not have originated as EDI, provide a standard BizTalk map, to get to an EDI schema that the assembler knows how to read and process to serialize the message correctly. In this example, we'll be looking at sending EDI messages. What I've started with here is this internal invoice. This is an invoice for just a, an XML schema. We don't have any extensions. It's not an EDI document. It's not anything related to EDI. It just happens to be our internal schema that we have but well, we need to send a message out based on this. So this message might come from one of our internal systems. And what we need to send out is one of these Edifact invoices. So this is an XML schema that represents an EDI. So we can see all the different EDI segments. We can see that the EDI tab is here. We know the extensions are enabled. So we have a, an EDI document and we have a regular XML document. And so as part of the process, we're gonna to need to map those things. Now we're gonna receive XML. We're gonna apply this map. So you can see we're mapping all these details from the internal schema over to the Adifact schema. 
And we're going to have then, when we get to a send port, an XML document. And we're going to need to serialize that out as an EDI document. We've got a couple different tabs down here. We can scroll those into view and see that we create that loop using some advanced items there. So I've already deployed this, our, our schemas and our maps now, out to BizTalk server and set up my sending application. So I want to take a look at my receive port. And you'll notice if I go to the inbound maps tab, I've applied that map. So we'll be receiving that XML file in, applying the map to it, and what will get published into the message box is going to be an XML representation of our Edifact, our EDI message. If we look at the receive location, you can see we're just using the XML receive here because that's the kind of file we're going to be picking up. We're not going to be picking up an EDI document. If we go to the send port and take a look here, you'll notice I am using the EDI send pipeline, which means that I had to add a reference to my application. If I go to the properties here and look at references, you can see that I have a reference to the EDI application. That's where that send pipeline lives. I'm not going to be able to configure my send port to use that pipeline unless I add that reference. So in the user interface, if I try and, and do this, I will only see the pipelines from within my application unless I reference that EDI app. And if I try and apply a binding file to do this, I'll get errors indicating that I don't have that reference set. Now I've also got a filter applied here and you can see down at the bottom that what I'm looking for is that specific schema namespace, that message type for my Edifact document, in this case the, the D96A invoice that's coming out. So I'm doing a subscription based on the specific message type coming through. Now if we look at our party information, you can see we have an agreement between Contoso and Northwind, but the protocol defined on there is X12. So we don't really have any agreement today that specifies settings for the Edifact processing. That means that when we go through the process, if I send messages through, we should be getting the fallback settings. So let's take an invoice here and we'll drop that in. Make sure my application is started. It is already started, so it should have picked it up. The message got picked up and now we have a message that came out. If we double click that, we can see we've got a EDI document, we've got our UMB on here. Notice for the sender, this is ZZZ, and then receive partner. And so we're not really seeing this, uh, the information we want. We've got BTS sender and we've got receive partner as our qualifiers. It didn't pick up that this was an exchange between Northwind and Contoso. And so it's using the fallback settings where these generic terms, BTS sender and receive partner, are the values that are supplied for the parties. So let's go create a new agreement then between our parties here. We come down to Northwind and we'll create a new agreement. And for the second party, we'll choose Contoso. We'll use their Contoso profile. I need to choose Edifact here. And what you'll notice is that in both sides, I don't really have a protocol set to choose. Neither of these organizations have specified settings for their particular, uh, for their particular profiles around Edifact. And so on the north window Contoso here, I want to go in. I should have a send port. Go to our send ports. We've got the Contoso Edifact file send port. That's our send port that we have set up. So we can provide that send port information now. That's going to help as the message is being processed in that send port. It'll help it find this particular agreement. And if we go to the identifiers, you can see that based on the profiles, it's already been populated here where we know that Northwind is specified and Contoso because we know that those are the organizations. We have their names specified in there. Now that we've applied those settings and created that new agreement, 
for artifact. Let's go drop this invoice over. Take a look at the new file. And now we can see that it was able to pick up those settings. We now see that it found the appropriate sender and receiver identifiers, and it would not only put the right identifiers in here for the parties, but would also pick up any other settings we had for the protocols or for the transaction sets to be applied. So we helped it out by giving it that send port information and providing protocol settings for Edifact so that it would know what to do and what the different parties were that were involved. In our second lesson, we'll learn about EDI batching, or the ability to batch up messages and send them out as a single EDI message. We'll learn about what batching is, how the batch orchestration works, and how we need to configure the batches so that we identify how to collect up messages into these batches. And we'll see then how do we create a send port with a subscription for these messages coming out as a batch. Finally, we'll take a look at a demonstration where we'll implement that batch processing. It used to be that many companies relied on VANs or value-added network providers to do a lot of their EDI processing. They didn't have a lot of the capabilities in-house that we have today with BizTalk. And those value-added networks provided services and charged based on the transactions. And so it was very common to group up documents and batch them up to reduce the cost of doing that. Today, it's just become a common practice that people expect in many scenarios to have message batched. They expect to receive them at particular times, or they expect to receive a batch with a certain number of messages in it uh, with other thresholds. And so it's just become a very common practice that messages that are going to be sent out through EDI to some partner are going to be a batch of messages to be processed. The EDI system in BizTalk supports this batching. And essentially what happens is that messages that are going to be included in a batch are first sent to an orchestration. That orchestration acts as the coordination engine for all these messages. And it's responsible for understanding the, what the configuration is about when to release those messages or when to release the batch. And it collects those up until such time that it should release those in which case we publish the message, we need to have a send port with a subscription, and it's then going to use the EDI assembler to take all those messages and create the single EDI document going out. Now a given party can have multiple batches identified with different criteria. It may be that we've got different kinds of messages that are getting batched up or different interactions that we want to do batching on. And so we can configure multiple batches on those parties, each one with different criteria. And ultimately that EDI assembler does its job of batching those things up, creating the envelopes and getting that document prepared to be sent out. The batches are actually gonna be configured on a particular agreement. That agreement, you remember, combines both the sender and the receiver and the interactions that they define and so that document specification is already on the agreement about what kind of EDI document we're sending out and the configuration of the, the batch is there. Now the way the batching works is that when you define a batch configuration, when you say I want to batch these certain messages up, that configuration is applied and there's a common and core orchestration that BizTalk provides for doing EDI batching. So when we create a batch configuration, a single instance of that orchestration gets created and is tied to that batch configuration. When that message first comes in that matches our configuration, that's a message that should be batched, it will go to that orchestration. It will then be processed in there and held as a reference until our conditions are met for when that message should be released. So it's possible that you will have several different instances of that orchestration running, each one managing a different batch. There may be batches for customer A and there may be batches for partner B. That same orchestration logic is reused and we have that single instance then per agreement and batch configuration pair.
Now the batch settings, when we create those, are going to involve identifying the batch and identifying the document standard, what kinds of documents we're we working with, but also then we'll define the filters and other settings in here. You can see the commands at the top of the batch window where we can start and stop. Those map directly onto commands against the orchestration. When we click start, we're going to create that instance of the orchestration and have it create its subscriptions and listen for messages. And when we create the stop message, we're going to stop that orchestration. Now within the configuration of the batch, we're going to have to identify a filter. The filter calls out which messages being received into BizTalk are messages that should be included in our batch that we're configuring. Now that's all processed by the batch marker pipeline component. It's something that's included in some of the out-of-the-box pipelines or we can put into our own receive pipeline. And that component's job is to look at the message, look at our batch configuration, and then ap apply the appropriate context properties when necessary. The orchestration has a subscription watching for the destination party name and this context property to be batched to be equal to true. So the batch marker component, if a message matches the particular filter, is going to then take that message and promote all those relevant properties so that it gets correctly routed to the orchestration instance correctly. Now as messages are being collected up into the batch, at some point we're going to want to re release them. We're going to want to send the message. And we could do that on a schedule. So we could say that we want to do it you know, hourly or daily or weekly. We could do it based on the number of transaction sets in the group or in the interchange or we could do it on the number of characters within an interchange. All of those are automatic triggers where the orchestration will manage those and read the configuration. We also have a manual process or an external uh, release trigger where we can send a message to that orchestration, especially formatted message, to indicate that we want to release that batch at the current time. This is an example of the kind of control message we can send. The type of adapter really isn't important. The, the whole point is that the XML message goes in, that it gets processed correctly by an XML receive or that XML disassembler to get the right uh, message type and context properties promoted. And the batch orchestration, while it's also listening for messages that are part of the batch, is also listening for these control messages. These control messages, some of them when we use the user interface to start and stop the orchestration control messages go in when we want to send out and indicate that we want to ex uh, release that batch we can send one directly in as well as i said that batch marker component is important it needs to be in a receive pipeline anytime you're receiving messages that you want to be included in the batch now you may be processing EDI documents on the receive, but you might also be processing flat files or XML documents. And so if you're not receiving EDI messages, it's important on that marker to set a, the flag, set the property that indicates that you're not going to do the EDI messages, that the it shouldn't check that encoding type, because that will only make sense if it's using the EDI messages and can find those values in there. Now, in addition to the to be batched and, and the destination party ID, it'll also put a to be routed property on there. So it'll promote all these properties in the context to aid in the subscriptions to get this stuff routed to the orchestration correctly. When you add this to a receive pipeline, you're going to want to put it in the party resolution stage. That way it's going to occur after any message disassembly, after the message has already been matched up to its schema and we have the context information such that the batch marker component can find all the information it needs in the message or in the message context to go out, look up the configurations, figure out what properties to promote and how in order to do its job. The messages, when they go into the orchestration, have a particular set of context properties and the subscription is subscribed to those. 
But when you want to receive the batch message coming out of the orchestration, you're also going to need to create a subscription. And in that subscription, you're going to want to focus on the receiver party name and make sure you choose EDI to be batched equal to false. If you left that at true, you'd be grabbing messages that should be going to the orchestration. You want to make sure that on your send port, you set that to false so you know that these are messages coming out of the batching orchestration. They're not intended to be batched or to send into the batch. They're ready to be released and can go off to a send port now. In this demonstration, we'll take a look at promoting properties for EDI batching so we can use that within our filter expression. We'll configure the EDI batching and set up our own pipeline with a batch marker component. And then we'll test the process to see if we can get messages coming in and being included in a batch and then released at the appropriate uh, trigger. In this demonstration, we'll look at batching EDI messages to be sent. Now here I have my internal invoice. And in that invoice, I've got a property here. This is part of my XML message that I'm going to be receiving. And it's been marked as a promoted property. So if I right click and look at the show promotions here, we can see that that promoted property, the them name, has been promoted as this thing called underscore underscore name. That's coming from my property schema here, which we look at has that particular value. So of course, because this is a promoted property, disassemblers will take this property and promote it in the context. We can use it for filtering and routing of our messages. Now to receive this XML message in and have it be processed by a batch, we're gonna to need to use the batch marker component. And so I have here a custom pipeline it has the XML disassembler because the message I'm receiving is going to be XML initially, but I can also put the batch marker component in this pipeline because I want it to mark this message as one that should be included in a batch. The only property on here, and the one that I need to set, is this ignore EDI message encoding type. Because it's XML, it's not EDI that I'm receiving, I need to tell the batch marker to not be concerned about EDI encodings or dealing with this as an EDI message and simply to do its batch processing logic based on the promoted properties and the filters that it finds. So I have my promoted properties and I've got my custom pipeline component in there. I need to actually go over to my application and change my receive location. In the previous demonstration when I was receiving these XML files, I just simply used the XML receive but now I'm going to switch over to my custom component or my custom pipeline where we're going to use that XML disassembler and that batch marker component in the receive location. Now I also need to go to my agreement because I need to set up the batching information. I'm going to set up my agreement here. I'm choosing the one that's based on Edifac because that's the one where I'm going to create these agreements. And the batching is going to be Northwind, or my company, batching up messages to send to Contoso. And so I'm going to send or choose the Northwind Contoso tab here. And then I'll create a new batch. We'll give that a name. We'll call that invoice batch. And I'll come down here and specify a filter. Now the filter is going to indicate which items are going to be in the batch. We should be able to come down to the bottom here and we'll choose, there it is, Contoso Schema's property schema name. I'm going to indicate that that's going to be equal to Contoso. So now I've got my filter that indicates that messages coming in with that value in the XML are things that should be included in the batch. And I now can focus on the release here for these items. So I'm going to do maximum number of transaction sets in uh, the group. And I'm going to say that I want to do three. So that indicates that once we have three messages within the same group, we want to release this now. I will click Apply. 
And you'll notice we can see that Batchik is not activated up here. We'll go ahead and hit the Start button. Now it says a control message is waiting to be processed. So it's sent a control message or put a control message in SQL Server. The batching orchestration, the EDI components monitor that control table for messages. So it should pick that up. Eventually when we hit refresh here then we should see that message get picked up and it should switch over to indicate that the batching is activated and the orchestration at this point isn't quite refreshed. You can see that batching is activated now for this particular system. Now if we go up here to the BizTalk group and we look, we can go search for subscriptions. And you'll notice that we have these XLang subscriptions for our batching service. So it's already been started. We've got two different activations here. These instance, uh, or rather instance subscriptions with the same ID. And if we go look at the expression, we'll see this one's looking for to be batched equals true, the receive party name of Contoso. It's got our batch name on there, the agreement name and the sender party name. So if all those things are true, if all those things get added to the context, then that's a match. And it also has a subscription that essentially says to be batched equals true, batch ID is one. All right, so both match essentially on that same batch information, but here we've got a simpler model or simpler subscription. So either one should match and send messages to now this running orchestration that's our instance of batching for this particular setup. So we need to go over to the send port now. And we've got our filters here. Before we were filtering on the message type, but now we want to go in and filter on the EDI and say to be batched. And here we want to indicate that to be batched is going to be false. We don't want messages that are going to be set to the batch. We want things that are coming out of the batch. And we'll also do the receiver party name to Contoso. So that information now is our filter where we want things coming out of the batching orchestration. So to be batched is false and where we're sending those things to Contoso. So we've set that all up. Those are all running. Now if we copy this over, BizTalk should pick it up, but we shouldn't see anything come out in the send directory because that message now has been routed to the batch. So we send another one over, that should get picked up as well. And finally, when I send a third one over, now the batch should get released, those messages should get processed, and now we get a batch message out here, and we can see that it's bigger than, than before. And we've actually got our batch of messages where all three of those messages have been batched together and sent out as one message. So we set up our property schema and our promoted properties that we could use to identify messages we wanted to include in the batch. We used our batching marking component on the receive pipeline to make sure we marked those to be part of the batch. And then we have the orchestration that was created as a result of us setting up our batch configuration where we identified the filter of those messages to be included. We identified the release criteria and our send port finally was configured with the filter that said that it wanted messages that were coming out of the batching orchestration, where to be batched was false, and that were destined for Contoso. So that enabled us to batch up those messages, only release them when we were ready, and send those off to our partner as a single message. In the lab for sending EDI messages, You'll create your BizTalk project and deploy the EDI schema and configure your BizTalk server applications. You're going to create an agreement that includes all the details that you need for sending your EDI documents and making sure they get processed correctly. And then you'll test the application to make sure that the EDI documents are getting sent correctly.